All right. So yesterday we left off. We had, we just kind of shown how the general relationship for Hooke's law in three D comes up for a linear elastic isotropic material, or Hooke's law is already linear elastic for an isotropic material. So uh, we had Hooke's law in three D. So uh, da, da, da. I have. I can define some epsilon xx over e sigma xx minus nu sigma yy plus sigma cz. Uh, and I have something similar for uh, epsilon yy and epsilon uh, zz. I have epsilon uh, xy is just 1 over, oh, ah, right. This, I think I messed up on this point yesterday. So here, um, it's important that I use the correct symbol. So this, I'm going to denote, if you remember yesterday, I talked a little bit about shear strain and engineering shear strain, where the definition of engineering shear strain was based on that simple shear case. Um, here, this, this gamma, I'm going to use to denote my engineering shear strain, and this is equal to 2 times my shear strain from that from that e equilibrium equation, or the, the gradient equation that I had shown before, where that epsilon is equal to 1 half gradient of u plus gradient of u transpose. So this factor of 2 is important to keep in mind and is the source of endless confusion for lots of final element programs. And I apologize, but there's not much that I can do about it other than to try to emphasize it for you guys. Uh, so there's similar equations for epsilon y, y, z, z, similar equations for gamma, x, z, and y, z. Um, for sigma, you can also write out, if you were to pile these all together and, and kind of invert them, you have a similar relationship of uh, uh, we came up, it, it kind of gets long and messy, but we can simplify it to 2e, 2g epsilon xx plus lambda trace of epsilon, where the trace of epsilon is just xx, y, y, uh, epsilon z, z. And then we had our sigma xy is equal to g gamma xy y, which is equal to 2g epsilon y. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so now for writing all these things out, <coughs> these, these, these equations, well, remember they're one for each uh, direction of stress and strain. Instead of writing all these equations out like this all the time, it turns out it's easier to represent this as a matrix uh, because it's always easier to represent things as a matrix. Uh, you'll see that linear algebra is used over and over and over again in all of solid mechanics. So here now, in order to represent this as a matrix, you remember our general stiffness, our general, uh, general stress tensor is some sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma zz, xy, uh, xz, <coughs> yz. Then this is uh, symmetric. So it's the same on the other side, and I don't want to write it all out. If I want to take this and multiply it by a matrix, so this <coughs> is a, a second order tensor. So it's a three by three uh, matrix, basically, but we're going to call it a second order tensor. To multiply this out, I would multiply it by a fourth order tensor. So a three by three by three by three tensor, uh, which you can't really visualize at all. It, it, I, computers can do it fine, but in, in our on paper, it's kind of hard to see. So what we'll do instead is represent this because we know there's only six elastic con or six stress constants here, we're going to represent this now as a vector. So 
here I can call this a sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, sigma 4, 5, and 6, um, or this is also 6, 5, 4, by symmetry. So basically I'm, I'm kind of coming up with a loop around here. And I'm going to convert this now to a vector based on that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 convention. So this now will be sigma xx, sigma yy, zz, yz, xz, uh, xy. These are getting gradually bigger as I go down. I don't know why I drew it like that. But uh, so this is known as Voigt notation. Um, just for for representing a stress tensor now as a vector, so this kind of makes this a little bit more convenient to do to do linear algebra math with. I can do something similar now for my for my strain tensor. Uh, my epsilon, I can then say using the same process of of one two three four five six and going around my my tensor in this loop, or going around my matrix in this loop, I can now say this is um, epsilon xx, epsilon yy, cz, uh, yz, xz, xy. I always draw the shorts. It's a good thing I have an eraser now. Do, 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 do. And this, I'm going to write like this sometimes. So sometimes. Other times, depending on who's writing it down, depending on what finite element software you're using, they could also use here the engineering, the definition of engineering shear strain, where uh, this now is epsilon xx, y, y. Z, gamma, y, z, gamma, x, z, and gamma, x, y, which is also equal to my epsilon, x, x, y, y, z, z, 2, epsilon, y, z, 2, epsilon, x, z, 2, epsilon, x, y. So actually from what I've seen this is the more common representation of it so in most if you if you input a full uh, like a full set of material properties into into a finite element solver you need to consider it like this is the engine you, you need to consider it in the engineering shear strain sense um, it kind of varies depending on exactly where, where you go and what you use, but just remember that sometimes some people will denote our, our stiffness tensor this way, some people will denote it this way, and there's not really a rhyme or reason to it. It's just because people had been engineering shear strain before they had kind of this full concept of stress and strain tensors mapped out, and so it gets a little bit weird. Anyway, so now uh, I'm actually going to be using this notation for most of the class uh, or when, I'm, when I'm writing the rest of these out, but the important thing is we have stress now as a vector and strain now as a vector that we can use. So I can take now this 3D Hooke's Law relationship uh, and I can plug these into vector relationships and I can say for an isotropic solid, uh, da, 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 this is now going to get big and long and ugly. Uh, maybe not ugly, it's just going to get big. Uh, I can now say my strain da, 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 uh, y, z, uh, 2 epsilon, uh, y, z, x, z, x, y. that is equal to, now this is a, 
uh, vector, 6 by 1 vector, so I need a 6 by 6 matrix to multiply this by. Oh, damn it, I did that again. Uh, I'm going to bring a constant because it makes it easier. Uh, there's a 1 over E out here, which is in all of these things. And I'm going to represent this. Um, so, blah. so I'd shown this relationship now with uh, with G's and Lame parameter and Poisson's ratio and E. I, if you remember, I told you you only need two of those to define all five of those elastic constants. So I'm going to write this using only two of those, specifically Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, because those are normally experimentally the easiest things to determine, so if people like using them. Um, so this now is 1 over E. Um, two, two, two. I have some sigma xx, sigma yy, zz, yz, xz, xy. This now you know that these relate based on 1 over e, uh, these relate based on a minus nu, uh, and a minus nu for sigma yy, uh, and then there's no relationship between the, the shear stress and the, the shear strain, so those are all zeros. Kind of similar now for the other constants, minus nu, minus nu, zeros, zeros, <coughs> Zeros. Okay. Um, for my shear strains, you remember that they don't relate to each other at all. So there's only going to be the one constant here. Now, instead of writing this, I could just write this as a as a g or one over g. But I'm going to write it in the in the, using Poisson's ratio and, and Young's modulus here instead. Uh, so this is then two one plus nu. 2 times 1 plus nu, 2 times 1 plus nu, zeros everywhere else. Sorry if this looks a little bit messy. Uh, it's slightly cleaner in the notes that I'll post online later. So this now, this relationship is E is equal to S sigma, where this <coughs> is a compliance tensor. So this is now a matrix representation of our 3D Hooke's law. So we took those equations that we had shown before, we reorganized our stress and strain matrices into vectors, and then wrote this all out as one big matrix formulation. So this is probably the most common way you'll see the 3D Hooke's law. Um, it's either this or in index notation, which is a lot cleaner and simpler, but I don't want to go through index notation because it's going to confuse the hell out of everyone. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I can do something similar now for the stress relationship. And again, I end up with a big, ugly matrix. So stress, da, 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 sigma xx, some more stuff eventually, sigma xy. This is equal to something that's a little bit more gross now because I'm going to write this all in terms of E and nu. Uh, 1 plus nu, 1 minus 2 nu. And you might recognize this as a Lemay parameter. Yep. The negative 1 over E is part of the tensor. Uh, this? Tensor. This is a, just a, a 1 over E. So yeah. po positive one over e, but yeah, it's it's part, it's part of it. So it gets it gets multiplied into all of these constants. So this is actually one over e, minus nu over e, minus nu over e, two plus one, two times one plus nu over e. Uh, instead of just writing e, uh, thir or twelve times. Yes. Yeah. So this this e gets multiplied into every component here. I'm just pulling it out because it's annoying to write otherwise. Um, similarly here, I really wouldn't want to write this constant out for every single index because um, then my matrix would take over the entire page. So here now, this relationship uh, is 
for all these constants. So I have, again, this big matrix, two, 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 epsilon x, x, some more stuff, more stuff. And this is my two epsilon x, y. So I'm uh, two epsilon x, z, two epsilon y, z. So I'm, I'm using this engineering shear strain definition. Um, you'll notice here that I have a two in front of some of these. If I used the other strain definition, I would take away this two and take away this two, which is really subtle and it's hard to catch sometimes. And again, is the source of endless confusion in finite element solvers. And there's not much that I can do about it other than, again, to, to let you know that this is a problem um, that you should keep your eye out for. So uh, here now, our stiffness tensor, or yes, stiffness tensor, new, new. There's no relationships between these. This is also a new, one minus new, 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 one minus new. These are all zeros. Uh, da, da, da. This is one minus two new over two. Yes, one minus two new over two. One minus two new over two. These are all zeros out here, and these are also all zeros out here. So this is now our, our 3D Hooke's Law of written into a matrix format. That's kind of the, the steps that we take for this. This, I can say now, is C epsilon, where this is my stiffness tensor. Um, I know, I, I understand the irony of having a stiffness tensor C and a compliance tensor S. I don't know why they switched them like that. It might have been a cruel joke from whoever came up with this in mechanics a long time ago, but it's generally the convention. Um, yeah, just just know that they're they're flipped. Anyway, uh, also, side note, for um, I'm not gonna have you know this. I'm not gonna require you guys to know this, but. If we were to think about thermal uh, th heat, uh, linear expansion due to thermal uh, cha change in temperatures, this is also where this comes in. So, so my E is equal to S sigma. Uh, this would actually be plus alpha delta T uh, and a one 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 zero zero zero. Similarly, stress. C epsilon plus uh, this one's uglier uh, E alpha delta T over one minus two nu one 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 zero 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 um, again I'm, I'm not actually gonna whoop, let's move that up I'm not actually gonna test you guys on this point at all or, or have much to do with it I just wanted to point out that here in this formulation, this is also where uh, thermal expansion comes in. And so where alpha here is a, your thermal expansion coefficient. Have you all seen thermal expansion before? Maybe, well, some, not all, a couple. Okay, ignore this. Uh, we're not gonna talk about it and I'm not gonna worry about it. Just know that if you, are you all familiar with the fact that if you heat a material up, it'll expand, and if you cool it down, it'll contract? Okay, and you're all aware that that's generally linear. Um, so if you heat it up by a temperature T, it'll expand unit X. If you heat it up delta 2T, then it'll expand 2X. Yes, okay. So here in our, in our stiffness and strain formulations, this is where that comes in. Um, but again, I'm not gonna try to drill into it. Okay, so let's talk about a more general case. So this is the specific case for uh, linear elastic isotropic 3D materials. So all the properties are the same in every direction. But this is a very special case of materials and actually very few work like that. Uh, so 
I want to look at a general stress state or general stress strain relationship. So here, first, let me roll back to, to so let's talk about general city uh, tensor relationships. So you remember that our stress and strain tensor, these are uh, second order tensors with nine. Um, so second order, which goes to nine constants, but then this becomes six constants by symmetry. So we got rid of, of half of them because we said it had to conserve rotational, or it, it had to, in a body in equilibrium, the, the momentum balance had to be zero on the body. So you can't have unequal shears. So there's only six stiffness constants and strain constants as a result. Our now, our stiffness tensor and our compliance, ten or compliance tensor and stiffness tensor are fourth order tensors with Generally, there would be 81 constants defining these. Because of the symmetry of these guys, this actually gets knocked down to 36 constants uh, by symmetry of sigma and epsilon, which also then goes to, gets knocked down further to 21 constants by symmetry of itself. So if you notice in, in our formulation here, this is a, a symmetric matrix, a symmetric six by six. So the ones on each side are equal. It turns out that's generally true for any uh, compliance tensor or stiffness tensor. So that makes it nice. And you see here, our six by six would have 36 constants because we already took it out of that four by four or fourth order tensor format and turned it into a matrix. Um, so here now for the most general stiffness and compliance sensors, there's 21 elastic constants that you would have to derive. What that looks like is now our C would be equal to C11, C22, 33, 44, four, 5, 6, 6, uh, 6, C, 5, 6, C, 4, 6, 3, 6, 2, 6, 1, 1, 6, 1, 2, 1, 3, jeez, C, 2, 3, uh, 2, 4, uh, three, four, uh, two, five, three, five. Oh, jeez. C, four, five. This is just this is just a mess. I apologize. These are not ordered at all. Again, it looks a little bit cleaner in the notes that I'll that I'll scan later. But but basically, you end up with this giant matrix with a full upper right diagonal here of all these constants defined, and this is then symmetric on each side. You can say something similar for the this compliance tensor S, uh, S11 all the way down, S66, S16, and I'm not going to write all these out. So this is the most, whoop, this is the most general form of a stiffness and a compliance tensor. There are very few materials that this actually applies to. Um, and generally, experimentally, if you wanted to figure out all 21 constants for a material, it is incredibly difficult. Um, realistically, you would have to rely on numerical simulations of the structure of the atoms, so like molecular dynamic simulations, and then you could try to find these constants out. Um, but as an engineer sitting in a lab, 
working on, I mean, we can do tensile tests and shear tests and torsion tests and kind of a limited subset of these sorts of things. It's very hard to figure all these out. So, yeah. Is that like one of the reasons you'd want to test like this sample that's only 100 nanometers in the box? Is that be able to calculate all these? Actually, sort of. So when you, when you get down to those really small testing regimes, it's actually really hard to measure elastic properties correctly because um, you end up with all sorts of weird compliance issues. But theoretically, yes. Um, actually, when you get down to those nanometer materials, that's when you sort of need to know all these constants because that's when you're working with the single crystals that actually some of which have, maybe not all of these, I think actually very few materials would have all of these, but some materials would have maybe nine or ten constants that you would need to know versus if you remember for our for this case there's only two constants you need to know to come up with this whole strain tensor and stiffness tensor so our linear elastic or our isotropic case is much easier than the general case um, yeah but so num numerical simulations on on materials at that scale yes that that's where it would become important. Um, to kind of simplify this a little bit, because I know that's a little bit heavy to think about, um, there's, I'll, I'll show you a, a slightly more specific case of anisotropy called uh, for, for orthotropic materials. So, orthotropic materials. Uh, what this means is there's three independent axes of uh, two-fold symmetry, which means if I have some block of this material, doo -doo -doo, it would have property property one in some direction, property one in the opposite direction. So if I flipped it um, 180 degrees, it would still have the same properties. Uh, it would have property uh, P2 in some other direction, and then P3 uh, in the last direction. And so it's the stiffness tensor for this guy or the, sorry, the compliance sensor for this guy, you can write out, now I need to know, I think, nine elastic constants, or no. Yeah, I think nine elastic constants. Um, but this I can write out, I'm not going to put anything out in front of here this time. Uh, this would be one over the modulus in the x minus new y x over e y minus new y, uh, sorry, z x over e z minus new x y over e x minus new x z over e x. Oh, this is already going to be too small. Uh, 1 over e y, 1 over e z new Y, Z, E, Y, uh, Z, Y, E, Z. These can be, are all zeros. Um, there are, oof. There are materials where if you apply a shear, it can cause an axial contraction or expansion. They're very rare, and it's normally with Skew, skewed crystal structures. So if you weren't your FCC and your BCC simple cubic, they all kind of fit into a nice box. It's all the same size. If that crystal was skewed at all, so if they, if the angles of that cube, if it wasn't a cube anymore, if, if they were skewed at some angle, then it turns out when you, when you apply a shear, it couples in axial displacements. Um, but for most materials, we don't want to worry about that because those are complicated. Uh, here now we have a G uh, 1 over 
g y z 1 over g x z g x y and again zeros here uh, I would try to write out the the stiffness tensor for this but it's super ugly and I don't want to because it would probably take up two pages of just trying to write it all out but so this is maybe a little bit more approachable so this this may have some Young's modulus in one direction different Young's modulus in a different direction different one in another direction and then similarly different Poisson's ratios in each of those directions different shear moduli but but this is actually maybe something that you can see and understand there's a relationship here that I didn't explicitly say but that is a thing um, which is uh, Poisson's reciprocal relationship so that is new x y over e x oh I don't need a minus uh, is new y x over e y so if I have this is kind of a convenient one which I sort of implicitly have here remember this has to be symmetric um, this is a useful one if, if I if I have different Young's moduli in the different directions um, and I push on a material it'll expand differently in those different directions even if I push on it in the X it'll expand differently in the Y if I push on it in the Y it'll expand differently in the X um, these sorts of materials like an orthotropic material if you remember at the very beginning we talked about cold rolled metals so something like uh, long and skinny maybe with long columnar grains as I as I roll this out it kind of stretches the grains along a certain axis axis along a certain axis so now grains aligned in a certain direction this would be actually an, an orthotropic material um, where even though there's some crystalline and grain structure the grains are then stretched along a certain direction more so than another one so it has different properties along those directions um, so even though it's not maybe the anisotropy in a single crystal there is some anisotropy there uh, a composite would be another very common example so like a carbon fiber composite is normally transversely isotropic so not there's the same properties in two of the directions but maybe a different a different property in the third direction um, for example uh, there's ways of quantifying this anisotropy so uh, if I if I want to know how anisotropic a material is how much I on time okay um, do to do, do so anisotropy quantification there's something known as a Zener Zener ratio which I'm going to define or which I'm going to define this guy Zener a long time ago uh, defined as A equals 2C 4, 4 over C11 one one minus C22. Two two. So if you remember from, oh, where did we go? Here. So C is our compliance tensor, uh, or C is our stiffness tensor. So here, um, there's all these constants out front that I'm going to ignore, but C44, four four, C1, C22. Two two. If I plug those in, this is 2 times uh, minus 2 nu over 2 is my C44. C11 is 1 minus nu. C22 is just nu. This is then equal to cancel some stuff. 1 minus 2 nu over 1 minus 2 nu, which should be equal to 1 for and anisotropic.
anamorphic material. So the further away from one this value is, the more anisotropic a material is. To give you some examples of, uh, of these sorts of materials, or of, of crystals, two, two, two. general crystal anisotropy, So, uh, some examples for FCC crystals, uh, we have like copper, uh, gold, aluminum, the A here is about 3.7, A is about 2.7, and A is about 1.2. This is for the crystal structure of the the copper, gold, and aluminum. So their their crystal structure is actually intrinsically anisotropic. Remember, this is sort of a ratio, even though there there's cubic symmetry. So even though it's the it's a cubic crystal, so FCC or BC, FCC is the same in every direction. They have different shear and Poisson's ratios that would then affect this anisotropy. Um, for BCC metals, uh, one of the fun ones is lithium, where it's super anisotropic, uh, somewhere on the order of like 9, 9.4, um, I think I've seen values as high as like 15 for it. Lithium is a very relevant metal for batteries nowadays. Um, something like an iron, uh, and an alpha, an alpha iron, which is a, a crystal organization of your iron A is around 2.4 and for tungsten which is a W A is actually pretty close to 1 so there are some materials who's who are relatively anisotropic even as even in their crystalline state but this is more of a coincidence than anything um, it just so happens that based on the atomic interaction of the tungsten ions or this, this is kind of it ends up being something around one. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, real quick. Um, uh, yeah. I'm gonna, now that we have, or first, maybe I should stop. That was a lot of things. Uh, was any of that confusing? Does anybody? <laughs> I know, there, there's like giant matrices of, of stuff. Are there any questions people can think of that they want clarification on. Can you just clarify what this number means exactly again? Like what one means and what like uh, one Yeah, yeah. So so this is taking some of those con out of this giant st uh, stiffness tensor. If it's equal to one, this is perfectly isotropic. So then we, if it's one, then we, we basically have our nice simple case for an isotropic material. Uh, and our stiff distancer would look like that. We would only need two elastic constants. Everybody would be happy. The world keeps spinning. Um, the further away from one it is, the, the more anisotropic it is. So technically, if there's, if there's any difference in any of these quantities at any point, um, like if I had this was like 1.1 times new or something, then it would be anisotropic. But this is this is sort of a nice. There's there's a whole different ways to measure anisotropy. This is just one kind of easy way to see it. Um, where here now one would end up our ideal thing, and further from one is is less and less isotropic, which means those other constants that are kind of out here are are further from that. Nice isotropic equilibrium that we're looking for. Yeah, I don't know if that helps. Hopefully, okay. Other things. Can you talk about what the compliance and stif the stiffness tensors are used for? Yeah. So I mean, so you remember for for like a a, a linear elastic bar, right? If I pull on this, then gets deformed and I have 
some some elastic stress relationship e here sigma epsilon this is a very simple one dimensional case so this is it, it only really applies for a very narrow subset of, of testing situations similar to the tension test that you guys are doing um, although technically there's also a Poisson's ratio expansion in at the same time but if I have now a general body where I'm applying a whole bunch of random stresses to it or forces to it or whatever three four um, and I want to know how this deforms in the elastic regime I need now to know what the stiffness tensor is or what the what the stress tensor is on it I need to know the relationship then between the the, the strain and the and the stiffness and so this stiffness tensor or the compliance tensor whichever way you're going is the 3d full 3d version of this so where this is just r1d case this is now arbitrary for any three-dimensional stress state on any solid yeah it's it would kind of simplify to the same thing eventually but this is yeah